in the heart of the South Caucasus lies the disputed territory of Nagorno-Karabakh, home to ancient monasteries with deep-rooted histories. On its edge stands the Armenian Apostolic Monastery of Dadivank, now reduced to ruins. Within its walls once lay a cryptic codex, of which only two photographs and a brief note remain. These clues were left by an amateur archaeologist who explored the site in 1913. Some believe this codex was a rare copy of the enigmatic Gospel of the Twelve. Tragically, the historian met his end in World War I, leaving behind one of the 20th century's most captivating unsolved mysteries. Part 1. John Lingard, Lawyer, Historian and Adventurer John Reginald Lingard was born on the 7th of September, 1884, in the enchanting town of Bonus on Lake Windermere, Westmoreland. This picturesque locale, with its sprawling lake and undulating hills, wasn't just a backdrop to John's childhood, but the very tapestry of his early adventures. Windermere was more than a hometown. It was a muse for artists, a sanctuary for writers, and an inspiration for young dreamers like John. John's lineage was an intriguing blend of law and aristocracy. His father, Thomas Lingard, was a respected solicitor known for his astute legal mind. On the other hand, his mother, Regina Caroline, brought a touch of nobility to the household. She was the daughter and co-heiress of Reginald Robert Walpole, the esteemed owner of Hanslope Park in Buckinghamshire. This stately mansion, set amidst expansive grounds, bore witness to many historical events and housed countless artefacts from the annals of British history. Growing up, John was regaled with tales from both sides of his heritage. From his father, he inherited a love for logic and a respect for the legal profession. But it was his mother's stories filled with grandeur, mystery, and old-world charm that truly captivated him. The family attic in Windermere was a treasure trove filled with heirlooms, ancient manuscripts, and curiosities from the Walpole legacy. These artifacts fueled John's imagination, igniting a passion for history and archaeology. John's academic prowess led him to the esteemed Harrow School, from which he graduated in 1903. From there, he went on to Trinity College, Cambridge, where he was conferred a BA in 1906 and an MA in 1910. In 1912, he achieved an LLD, a Doctor of Laws, showcasing an in-depth mastery in legal studies. With this achievement, John was not just academically distinguished, but also well prepared to join his father's solicitor practice. However, John's time at Cambridge was more than just legal studies. During his MA, a guest lecture by Sir Frederick Kenyon changed the trajectory of his interests. Sir Frederick was a distinguished British paleographer and biblical and classical scholar. He served as the director and principal librarian of the British Museum and was an expert in ancient texts, especially those of religious significance. Kenyon's lecture on ancient manuscripts and their relevance to modern scholarship left a profound impact on John. Inspired and intrigued, John approached Kenyon after the lecture. Their shared passion for ancient texts led to a rich correspondence the letters between the young scholar and the seasoned expert were filled with discussions about recent discoveries, interpretations of ancient scripts, and the mysteries of forgotten civilizations. Outside the confines of classrooms and libraries, John's youth was marked by adventures and escapades. Rumours of his daring undertakings in search of rare artefacts and manuscripts added to his reputation as a playboy and adventurer. While he was deeply engrossed in law, his heart was truly captivated by the world of archaeology and ancient history. 
After completing his LLD, John decided to take a sabbatical from the legal world and immerse himself in his true passions before settling into his father's practice. Part 2. The Journey to the Codex The Caucasus, a region at the crossroads of Eastern Europe and Western Asia, is a land of contrasts, towering mountain ranges, including the majestic Caucasus Mountains, cradle lush valleys and serene lakes. Historically, a melting pot of cultures, religions and empires, the Caucasus has been a battleground for power and a haven for those seeking spiritual enlightenment. The region's cultural richness is mirrored in its stunning array of ancient churches, monasteries and fortresses, many of which are perched on seemingly inaccessible mountain peaks. Drawn by tales of ancient texts and the birthplaces of early Christianity, John embarked on his first journey to the Caucasus in 1913. This expedition saw him traverse the winding paths of Georgia, where he marveled at the frescoes of the Svetitskoveli Cathedral and sought solace in the tranquility of the Gelati Monastery. Venturing further into Armenia, he was captivated by the ethereal beauty of the Geghard Monastery carved into the cliffs of the Azat River Gorge. His thirst for exploration brought him back to the region in the summer of 1914. This time, his travels took him to the contested terrains of Nagorno-Karabakh, an area marked by its rugged beauty. Nagorno-Karabakh, meaning mountainous black garden, has been the apple of discord between many empires throughout history. Its rolling landscapes are dotted with ancient fortifications, churches and monasteries bearing silent witness to its tumultuous past. It was here that John stumbled upon the Dadavank Monastery. Nestled amidst the verdant embrace of the Karabakh Mountains, Dadivank stood as a beacon of Armenian Christian heritage, its stones etched with centuries of prayers, hopes and sorrows. Within the hallowed walls of Dadivank, John encountered a codex, its pages aged and script almost forgotten. This wasn't just any ancient manuscript, but seemed to be a version of the legendary Gospel of the Twelve Apostles. This elusive text, whispered about in scholarly circles, was believed to contain teachings not just from Christ, but directly from his Twelve Apostles. The Codex's script, though barely decipherable even to the monks, had elements that John with his academic background and insights from his correspondence with Sir Frederick Kenyon, recognised as potentially significant. Understanding the gravity of his discovery, John tried to negotiate with the monks, hoping to bring the Codex back for further study. Despite his generous offers, the guardians of Dadivank refused to part with their sacred treasure. Undeterred, John discreetly photographed the Codex and, in a move driven by both academic zeal and a touch of recklessness, he managed to secretly secure a single page from the book. As shadows of unrest began to loom over the Balkans, hinting at the impending world war, John hastened his return. He developed the photographs, inscribed a note on the back detailing his discovery, and dispatched them to the esteemed Sir Frederick Kenyon in London, hoping they'd be the key to unveiling the secrets of the Gospel. Part 3. Return, War and the Ultimate Sacrifice The geopolitical tremors of 1914 were becoming increasingly hard to ignore. The assassination of Archduke Franz Ferdinand in Sarajevo on June 28th set in motion a series of events that would culminate in the First World War. Sensing the urgency of the situation and understanding the potential perils of being caught abroad, John hastened his return to England. By early July 1914, he was back on British soil, clutching the invaluable page from the Codex. While he had hoped to share and discuss his findings with Sir Frederick, the rapidly deteriorating international situation soon overshadowed academic pursuits. 
With a strong sense of duty and patriotism, John enlisted in the British Army. He joined the 6th Manchester Regiment as a second lieutenant, a position reflecting both his education and his family's status. The Western Front was a maelstrom of trench warfare, with soldiers ensnared in a brutal, unyielding stalemate. In 1915, seeking a fresh perspective and perhaps driven by a desire for a more active role, John transferred to the Lancashire Fusiliers. The Lancashire Fusiliers were part of many significant battles and John's leadership and dedication quickly distinguished him among his peers. August 1915 saw the Allies launching an assault on Suvla Bay as part of the Gallipoli campaign, aiming to secure the Dardanelles Strait. It was a strategic point, offering a direct route to the Ottoman capital, Constantinople. On the 21st of August, the Lancashire Fusiliers were embroiled in heavy combat, with both sides suffering substantial casualties. It was during this fierce battle that John Reginald Lingard met his tragic end. The chaos of war meant that many soldiers, including John, were never recovered, their final resting places known only to the winds and sands of Gallipoli. It is believed that John had kept the page from the Codex with him, even while serving during the war. It has never been found and most likely fell with him on that fateful day at Gallipoli. Sir Frederick Kenyon, too, found himself drawn into the wartime vortex, taking on roles that leveraged his expertise but drew him away from his academic pursuits. The photographs and note sent by John, once seen as a groundbreaking discovery, became an afterthought, lost amidst the urgencies of a nation at war. It was believed that these invaluable photographs had been housed in the British Museum only to meet their tragic end during the Blitz of 1940. The relentless bombings by the German Luftwaffe over London saw many such treasures reduced to ashes. However, the wheel of time has a way of bringing lost stories back into the light. In 1972, nearly six decades after John's tragic demise and the presumed loss of the photographs, a twist of fate brought them back into focus. Upon the passing of a curator at the British Museum, a search of his possessions led to the discovery of copies of John's photographs. Also found was a transcription of the note John had penned to Sir Frederick Kenyon. To Sir Frederick Kenyon, I trust this letter finds you in good health and spirits. My recent journey to the Caucasus has brought to light some intriguing findings. Within Dadavank Monastery, I chanced upon a codex that, to my estimation, might be of profound historical significance. From my preliminary observations and based on our prior discussions, I'm inclined to believe this could indeed be the elusive Gospel of the Twelve. The script and the context hold many of the hallmarks we have theorized about. I understand the weight of such a claim and, therefore, plan to return to England post-haste for a more comprehensive analysis alongside your esteemed expertise. Until then, I implore you to keep these photographs and my observations in utmost confidentiality. I eagerly await our forthcoming discussions on this matter. Warm regards, John R. Lingard, 5th of June 1914. The rediscovery of this note and the photographs rekindled interest in John's expedition and the potential significance of his findings. Epilogue, The Lingard Codex, a book lost to time. The end of World War I saw a reshaping of the global map. Empires fell, new nations arose and regions were realigned. The Caucasus, always a melting pot of cultures and ambitions, was no exception. Nagorno-Karabakh, with its rich history, became a focal point of geopolitical tensions between Armenia and Azerbaijan. Amidst these tumultuous times, the Dadivank Monastery, like many other historical sites, bore the brunt of change. The once thriving seat of religious devotion and learning saw periods of neglect its ancient walls witnessing not just prayers, but the pain of a region in turmoil. 
As borders shifted and populations moved, the monastery was abandoned by its guardians. Over time, the elements, coupled with human neglect, led to its gradual decline, with many of its treasures lost or pilfered. The codex that John Lingard had so passionately pursued, believed to be the gospel of the Twelve Apostles, was among the casualties. Whether it was taken by an opportunistic looter, hidden for safekeeping, or simply decayed with time, remains a mystery. Its absence leaves a void in the world of religious scholarship, a tantalizing piece of history that might forever remain elusive. John Lingard's sacrifice, however, was not lost to time. The Hellas Memorial stands as a testament to the many brave souls who gave their lives during the Gallipoli campaign. Etched in stone, among countless others, is John's name, forever commemorating his bravery and sacrifice. Back in his hometown of Windermere, a stained glass window in the parish church captures the essence of his life, a blend of academic pursuit, adventure and duty. In our quest for understanding the past, we are often met with more questions than answers. The story of John Lingard reminds us of the fragile nature of history. As we reflect on his journey, we are left with a sense of wonder and a deeper appreciation for those who venture into the unknown, driven by an insatiable thirst for knowledge.